All right. Welcome to our virtual career speaker series here with JA of Southern Colorado. We're thrilled today to have uh, another amazing and outstanding community member uh, in Pueblo, Colorado, actually one of our districts here that uh, Southern Colorado serves. Uh, Christina Anderson and Christina Anderson has a great story uh, and uh, a myriad of contributions back to her community uh, but additionally she is a business owner she's the founder owner and a performer at uh, upon a star singing telegrams and entertainers uh, that serves Pueblo and the local community there and and even further I'm excited for you all to hear from Christina because when we talk about dreams and we talk about building dreams, she's one of those people that will certainly inspire you. So Christina, I wanna welcome you and thank you so much for joining us today. And, and I would just love for you to start by telling us a little bit about, okay, number one, you know, tell us about your entertainment company, how it came to be and, and what your motivation was to start your own business uh, that gives back to your community in this way and really i mean i would say you make dreams come true for for young people all across your community especially so tell us a little bit more about it well thank you thank you for this opportunity i'm so excited to share about myself and my company and what fun i get to have basically number one my company is about fun and um so upon a star singing telegrams and entertainers came about in 2010 so I am celebrating my 10 year anniversary this year, owning my business. It started in October of 2010. Um, I'll back up a little bit. I used to work for a singing telegram company out of uh, Denver. Um, it was Eastern Onion singing telegrams. And I worked for them for five, six years. I even worked through my pregnancy. Um, I would actually go to Fort Carson a lot and tell soldiers they were going to be dads. Um, pregnant out to here, barefoot and pregnant. It was pretty hilarious. Um, so I um, even worked through my pregnancy. It was a lot of fun. Uh, that's when I started to get to do Mae West because I was not... Um, I was not ready to do Mae West until I was a little bit bigger. So um, they had me do, you know, other characters before that. And uh, I loved doing Amazon Woman. And I would sometimes dress as a gorilla. You never knew, you never know what kind of character I would pop out as, whether I was in a restaurant or I was at a party. It didn't matter. Um, I even did Barney. Oh my goodness. I even did Barney when I was pregnant. That was a scary experience at a birthday party once. I've got lots of fun stories like that. Um, but um, I had a great time doing that. I sang to the first passengers getting off the first flight at DIA, dressed as a Wagnerian opera singer. I had my horn helmet like this and my breastplate and my shield and my sword and, you know, saying, you know, to dream the impossible dream, DIA, we've been waiting so long. Um, it was crazy. If you have, anyone remembers about DIA and their baggage system and everything that was going wrong with opening that airport, I sang about all of that. It was hilarious. Um, so I had a great time doing singing telegrams for them. Uh, they closed the company, I would say in about, let me think, it was around 1996, uh, 97 that they closed the company in Denver. And I was here in Pueblo, um, of course, always been involved in the performing arts. Um, since I was 13, I've been singing. And so I was I was involved with an organization here in town that was involved with getting performing arts organizations together. And there was a request in the Union Avenue district, the shopping district. Um, it was coming up on the holiday time and they wanted some carolers to be walking up and down the street and, and create that ambiance for their shopping district. And so they contacted me and they said, you know, could you have your kids do something like this, you know, for children's corral? I said, well, no, that's not really not going to work with our schedule right now, but I have kind of a connection to full Dickens caroling costumes that are at a, a church that I used to go to. Um, I can get those costumes. I can put a cast of, of people together to sing and I can do it. We can do it. So a pot of star was born. Um, and basically because out of need for singing carolers in the downtown Pueblo district. So that's how it started. Uh, and we started with caroling 
And we had a great time caroling that year outside in whatever snowy conditions, non-snowy conditions, cold conditions there were. And we would just stop in front of shops and sometimes we'd pop inside shops and sing a few carols and it was wonderful. We had a great time doing that. Then from that, it evolved into princess parties and doing birthday parties as princesses and things. So I have a whole cast of that work for me as princesses. I myself dress as several. I do Elsa and Snow White and Belle um, and Cinderella from time to time. So you never know. Uh, but I have a great time doing that. And I have a whole cast of great girls and guys that work for me. Uh, most of them are high school or college students um, that are involved in the arts in some way and performing um, or that have been in children's corral and they now work for me professionally. So I have a great time, you know, working with them, training them, um, putting them into some in some situations that they've never pictured themselves in um, and they have a great time doing it. So it evolved into so caroling, then birthday parties, princesses, and then I decided why not bring singing telegrams back into this? Because I loved doing singing telegrams, you know, out of for the company out of Denver. So I said, you know what? I'm just gonna start adding costumes to my, you know, to my my wardrobe, basically. I have a wardrobe of costumes. And I just started adding more and more and more characters and things that I offer. Um, and you just never know when I'm gonna burst into a restaurant or a business or a home and start singing at the top of my lungs and it's great and i love it and um i think when you when you live your passion when you do your passion that's what's most important um i had a you know someone told me when i was younger probably about 15 16 years old that if you find out figure out what you want to do in life what your passion is and then figure out a way to make money at it that is what i took to heart my whole life and whether that means you know, you have to go through some training for that, whether that means you go to college for that or a trade school or whatever it might be, that's what you do in order to live your passion. And I am not doing exactly what I had planned to do when I was in high school. Um, when I was a senior in high school, I started my training to work in the travel industry. So halfway through my senior year of high school, back then, you know, we didn't have the computer, the online stuff that we can get on. So they literally sent me books. They sent me correspondence, it was called, um, for my travel training. I was going to work the friendly skies. I was going to be a flight attendant or I was going to be a reservation sales agent. And so I started, you know, doing the correspondence for that during my senior year. I was doing both at the same time. By the time I finished my senior year of high school, I was ready to go to Florida for my on-site training. Um, and then my now husband, but he was my boyfriend at the time, uh, he proposed marriage. And so at that time, I was like, hmm, do I go away for weeks at a time working as a flight attendant, meeting really handsome pilots, or do I marry my husband? <laughs> so I, uh, I chose to get married and I chose, uh, so in 1991, I got married. Um, I've been married almost 30 years. Um, it'll be 30 years in January. Um, and I walked away from working the friendly skies. So I, after that, I decided to um, go back to my passion, which was music. And I'm so glad I did. I started working. I, I taught for five years um, music at two different Christian schools here in town simultaneously. <laughs> and then I started the Pueblo Children's Chorale in 1996, which I don't regret. We're about to start year 25. And then I went back to doing, uh, you know, I started this business in 2010, you know, so I, I have a great time doing what I do. Am I doing what I originally planned? No, but I, am I happy doing what I'm doing? Absolutely. I don't regret it one bit. So, um, I'm very happy that my husband supports me in my passion. He supports me in my businesses. He's my right arm. Um, he helps me whenever I need help with anything. So I literally work two businesses from my home. One's a nonprofit and one's for profit. So, um, so that's what I get to do. I get to work in the performing arts. I get to work 
at doing my passion. And I can't think of anything better than that. Absolutely. And I think partnership is so important. You know, we talk a lot about having the right partners in your life and along the way. Tell me about music. How old were you when you first, you know, I think I can sing, but it's not good. I mean, no one wants to hear it. I love to sing. I am, I am very passionate about singing, but unfortunately, no one wants to hear me sing. How old were you when you discovered you had a gift and a talent? Or was it something that you had to nurture and learn? It, is it something that we can learn and train or do we have to be born with a gift? I would say a little bit of both. Um, some, some are born, you know, ready to just, you know, start singing and you know, those little kids that walk around, you know, one and a half, two years old. My son was one of them who would just go around the house and just, you know, sing everything he could grab his little guitar and start playing. Um, you know, that you know, those kids, you've seen those kids and you know, those kids are going to be artists one day. You just, you just know it. Um, I started singing, uh, I started singing as early as third grade. I was in choirs at school. I knew that I loved it. I knew that, I mean, I didn't know that I, I didn't know if I was good. I, you know, I would blast music in my room and sing at the top of my lungs, you know, songs from the radio and just have a great time and, you know, try to master everything. I tried to be Whitney Houston, you know, everyone wanted to be Whitney Houston, you know, when they were younger, you know, in my age. Uh, so, yeah. so we all wanted to be Whitney Houston and Mariah Carey, you know, and blast those songs and, and, and belt to those songs. Um, I knew, you know, I sang my first solo in church when I was about 13. It was an Amy Grant song, I'll never forget it. Um, and so I knew that when I did that, the feeling that I had when I finished singing was nothing other that I've ever felt before. And um, I knew from that moment on that, that music had to be a part of my life. I was lucky enough in high school to have a music director, Ken Butcher, um, who was basically my mentor, my, oh, my inspiration. Um, he's from England and he's, you know, he was a fantastic music teacher in our district for years and years and actually was the first music director we hired for Pueblo Children's Chorale. So it kind of came full circle that I was his student and then I became his boss <laughs> in, a, in a sense. Um, it was kind of fun and uh, I, will, I will never forget all the years that I had with Ken Butcher. I get a little teary because he was just, he's an amazing man. He, I mean, he's not, you know, he's not, he's still alive. So he's not gone. Thank God. Um, but I mean, he's just, he's always there, like in the back of my mind as this, this inspirational person. And, you know, he gave me my first solo in choir at, at, in high school. And, you know, on a very special recording that we were making for, we were making an audition tape for some kind of like CMEA or something like that to perform. And he gave me the solo and I was so excited. I was like, oh, I can't mess this up. You know, I have to do this right, you know, and, you know, and that he picked me to do that. I was just so, it was so exciting. I, I have not, you know, in, in my whole professional career of singing and performing, there, there's been, there's been so, so many moments that bring me to just absolute, you know, fulfillment and joy. You know, sometimes it's when I'm dressed as Elsa and, you know, it just happened to me about a week ago that this little girl that had, you know, spina bifida, she was turning 12 and, you know, Elsa's her favorite. She loves Elsa. She loves Frozen. And when you show up um, and you're dressed as that character and you are in that character, there is nothing I'm, I'm just going to tell you, there's nothing that can fulfill you more that when that child actually believes you are who you are dressed as and you are, you are singing the song, you are portraying that character and all of a sudden they just break down and cry. And I mean, she just broke down. I'm here, I'm in, you know, singing, let it go. And I get to the end of the song and she just puts her hands in her head and she just starts bawling. And I'm just, I'm getting choked up. And I'm like, how am I going to get through this? <laughs> you know? um, I, I don't know how to, you know, you almost don't know how to respond, but I've been doing this for 30 years of my life now that I just wrapped her in my arms and I just told her, you know, 
everything's fine. You know, Elsa is so excited to be here with you. I am just so happy that I got to be here for your special day. And, you know, I'm just telling her just all these things and she's just so happy. She wouldn't let go of me the whole time I was there. She had to just show me everything in her room, everything, you know, her hamster, everything. So she had to just, you know, show me all of it. And she just looks up at me and her mom just got the perfect picture of her just looking up at me with those eyes and, you know, with tears coming out of her eyes and tears are coming out of my eyes. I mean, they're coming out of my eyes right now. So sorry, but it just makes me so emotional. Um, Another moment I had as a performer was when I took my second group to Disney to perform, my, my Upon a Star cast. I took them twice to Disneyland to perform. And here we are performing on stage and it was just after Christmas. It was the week between Christmas and New Year's. And we just had an amazing performance. That cast that I took that time, they were just outstanding. I'm talking about some of the best performers Pueblo has ever seen were on that stage with me that day. And, you know, back in the back, you see Pluto, you know, dancing with you, you know, to your songs. He's going back and forth and he's singing. And you see cast members back there that are dancing to your songs and cheering you on. And we had the most amazing crowd. It was so full. Um, because of it being the time of year it was, it was just crazy busy, you know, during that time at Disneyland. And I walked off the stage after we performed and I just, I broke down in tears. I just, I fell to the floor and my cast was like, they were looking at me like, ooh, what's wrong with Tina? <laughs> I mean, they kind of know I'm an emotional person anyway, but that performance just took me to another dimension as a performer. There's just no other way to say it. I mean, when you have those moments singing and you just know that you're touching souls and your soul is being touched as well in a different way than you can with just having a conversation with someone, it's, it's a whole other dimension. I just, it, there's just no other way to say it. To be blessed with what I have in my talent, I know that it's a blessing. I know that it's an honor to be blessed with what I have. I never take it for granted. And I always, I always try to bring my very best. And when I don't, I get so frustrated with myself. So, I mean, there are times that, you know, you just aren't feeling well or whatever, and you know that uh, you just might not bring your best that day, but even still, I try. Um, and I know that I may not be bringing 110% like I planned, but I know that I'm going to do my very best. And that's all, you know, that's all I can do at that time. You never know when I'm going to get a call for a singing telegram. It could be, I could get a call in an hour and have to be in Springs by four o'clock this afternoon. You just never know. So, you know, I have to be ready to go, you know, pretty much if my, avail if my availability is open, I just go. I don't really schedule, you know, I, I, I have that availability to schedule my life, you know, and that's why I'm able to volunteer so much with JA, which I love. And, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm able to have that flexibility in my life and do what I want to do. So singing has blessed me in so many ways. I can't even tell you. I just, I'm, I'm so glad that I get to do what I get to do and that I get to bring that joy. Uh, Cause that's, that's the thing. I try to bring the joy. And a few years ago, I kind of lost that joy. I kind of lost like the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing. I had just had some frustrations in my life, um, some health issues in my life. And I, I literally lost that joy for a little while. And I had to just remember why I do what I do, what motivates me to do what I do, what motivates me to get out and, and work hard. Because as an entrepreneur, you have to work hard. And if you're an entrepreneur in the performing arts, you have to even work harder. I mean, you have to put yourself out there. You have to be willing to basically make yourself raw in front of anybody. Um, and you have to just let down your guard and do whatever you're going to do whenever they ask you to do it. And you have to be open to whatever they ask you to sing, however they ask you to dress, you know, whatever. And you have to be willing to do that. You have to be, you have to be ready for that. I mean, so if, there, if there's any kind of, of advice that I could pass on to someone that might be wanting to go into a career in the performing arts is that train, absolutely train. 
um, you know, go to school. If you, if you're become a, if you want to be a vocalist, you know, train to be a vocalist, go to school for, you know, vocal training, um, work with it, work with an, uh, a person that can train your voice well, um, you know, a vocal specialist, because that's highly important. Go to singing lessons, do your singing lessons. Um, if you're an instrumentalist, you know, wh whatever it might be, theater, whatever it might be, work on your craft. You have to work on your craft. You can't just put it aside and say, oh, I'm just not going to work on it today because I just don't feel like it, you know? And honestly, when you work in the performing arts, yes, it's, it's based a lot on, there's a lot of emotion in what you do, but you have to work at it. You can't just say, oh, I'm a fantastic singer and I'm just going to go do what I want to do and, you know, be done with it. You have to work. You have to train your voice. And, you know, I've been training my voice for a long time. You know, it's, it's a long, 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 long process. And so I never say I'm the best. I don't believe I'm the best. I know there are people better than me. I know there are many people better than me. Um, but I go out and do what I do out of passion and love for what I do. And that has to be part of it too. So you have to have the training. You have to have the passion and the love for what you're going to do. And you have to be willing to put yourself out there as a performer. If you're, if you are not willing to just take on whatever and do whatever people may ask or want you to do, especially if you're in the line of work that I'm in, then it's really not for you. <laughs> so you have to, you have to be willing to put yourself out there. So sorry to get a little bit emotional with that question, but um, oh. what I do, what I do is emotional. I mean, there's just, it's just part of it. I think the passion that you have for what you're able to do every day is it's inspiring. So if, if all of us had something that we were so passionate about that we also could make a living from, and, you know, I mean, we all want to find that passion. That is, that is ultimately the dream is to, to be able to every day um, give to something that gives back to you and brings you joy too. So you, your passion is so evident. And, and we talk to students who have athletic dreams. We talk to students who have performing dreams. Um, and one of the things that at Junior Achievement, we also like to try to talk about is you, may, you have a great talent. You need to work on that talent. But additionally, if you want to be an entrepreneur and you want to work for yourself, there are business skills you're going to need to bring to the table to ensure that you can survive in this business, whether it's your market size, who your customers are, understanding small business loans. Um, what are those things that you, you know, you, uh, you, you had a gift and you wanted to know how to use that gift, but you had to, you built two businesses here. You've built a nonprofit and a business, uh, you know, over the last, um, uh, gosh, so since when 96, is that, um, I always say, I always say the eighties yeah. were 20 years ago because I'm wrong. So I, I have that all wrong in my head as a, you know, in a, as a person in her mid forties, I, I mess it all up, but you know, when, when you take a look over the history of your career, how did you obtain the business acumen and the business knowledge to know how to, how to start your own business? And then nonprofits, a whole nother step, but let's, let's focus on here today. How did you, how did you hone that skill? Well, it's because of me starting a nonprofit that gave me the skills to do my for-profit, if that sound, you know, kind of backwards, but because I started the children's crawl 25 years ago and I knew nothing about running a nonprofit, I was the president of the board for the first 10 years of the organization. So in that time, um, we, we weren't, we were a nonprofit, but we weren't running our organization to its full extent, I guess I should say. So for the first 10 years of me doing that job for the Children's Corral, I didn't get paid. I was the president of the board. So we had a board. And then we evolved into me being the executive director after 10 years. That's when I started being paid. And it was because I was able to start writing grants. And so all of this training I had never had, I never, I didn't know the first thing about writing a grant. I had no idea how to do any of that, doing budgets, all that kind of stuff. 
it was because of the training that I went to, I decided to take a nonprofit course at CSU Pueblo that was offered. Um, so it was a nonprofit like management it was a nonprofit leadership kind of course that I took, um, and actually it went off the it went off the book the book Nonprofit for Dummies. <laughs> that's the that's the course book that that she used for that. Um, I started taking classes. I took another class at PCC on Photoshop just so I could do marketing stuff better um, and making posters and things like that. Anything that was offered, I mean, so many classes and trainings were offered through the library, through other nonprofit associations, on grant writing, on leadership, on whatever. I mean, you could even ask my husband. He's like, you're going to another class? You're going to another training? Anything that I could get my hands on and go do, and most of them were free, I went to because that was just another way of me gaining some knowledge. There is, there's no course, there's no course in non, there's no degree in nonprofit management. I have not been able to find one. Not even to this day can I find a degree in nonprofit management. You can get a degree in business management. Um, you can get a degree, you know, in business in general, but not in not, not specifically nonprofit. So I had to train myself. I had to, tr I had to go to everything I could find in training myself. I did that for, I, I still do that. If I see a class that's offered on, I go to classes all the time on social media stuff because boy, if there's anything that's changing constantly, it's not, it's, it's social media stuff. So if there's a class offered at the library on, you know, SEO, functionality or um, Facebook or using other, you know, Twitter, other, other things like that, you bet I'm going to be there. I'm going to go because anything that I can gain knowledge on, I'm going to go. So, um, so I did that and that, and that was a huge part of my training is learning how to run a nonprofit. And then when I decided to do a for-profit, when I started upon a star, it was so much easier. Um, you know, just to, I knew exactly what to do to get my licensing with the state, to get my federal tax ID number. I knew how to do all of that and start all of that, how to do a budget, how to, you know, make sure that I was, you know, getting everything taken care of as far as my business is concerned. Um, hiring people, um, all of that, all of that came from my knowledge of running a nonprofit and learning all of that over, you know, 15 years, 15, you know, yeah. About 15 almost 20 years before I started my own for-profit business so yeah, yeah it kind of came about that way and you talked a little bit about the for-profit business and how it, it was filling a need for the community you, there what you were in the community it was holiday time and you know, it was clear that the community wanted something and I would say I mean I just think about that Having the opportunity to have carolers walk around your downtown, you know, during during Christmas time, holiday time, and what a what a joy that must have been for all of the residents and everyone in the community. And I'm sure they recognize that. And then that's a way to get to get your name out. Um, I do. They have started some nonprofit degrees, or nonprofit management, nonprofit leadership degrees. Um, my uh, neighbor uh, is actually she was inspired by junior achievement and is actually getting her degree in nonprofit management right now. So just in the last three to five years, we've really had that pick up um, as, uh, as something that students can major in now, which is exciting, Christina. So that is, they, that is you so know, all good. the. The I am so you, happy to hear that. Yes. Yeah, the things that you had to piece together, you know, and that most people just sort of have learned trial by fire, right? Like you're running a nonprofit, go. Um, but but sometimes in business, you, you might feel the same. But, you know, being a solution provider for your community, how can a student understand more about their community to find where the where the opportunities are? How can they come in and say, okay, I have this skill, I have this passion, and I need to align it with something that my community needs. It, it came to you in a very, um, in a very organic way, but can a student really seek that out for their community? How would you suggest they go about trying to find what gaps, what holes exist where they're at or where they want to, you know, make their, you know, settle and make those roots? When you're talking about entrepreneurship, you're talking about starting a business. Um, we might have an idea of what we think works, but the people have to want that too. We need customers. So what, what advice would you have for students for aligning your passion and your talent with what the community needs? Exactly. 
Well, first, I'm so I'm so thrilled to hear that they have degrees in nonprofit management now because you're right, it was being thrown in by fire. I mean, thankfully, I had a little bit of help. I was in the Pueblo Choral Society at that time, which was the adult version of the Children's Chorale, and I had been on their board for a few years, so they at first had me in as PR chairman. Um, then they had me in as hospitality chairman. So I learned some things that way, and so really, you know, in keeping, in keeping your ear to the ground, you have really got to pay attention to what's going on in your community. Get involved in those organizations that are involved in your passion. Um, for me, it was being involved with the Pueblo Choral Society. It's, it's direct involvement in the Pueblo Choral Society to the reason why I started the Children's Chorale, why we started the Children's Chorale. There was a need in the community for a children's choir. I mean, we had one in Colorado Springs, we had one in Denver. Why not have one here in Pueblo? So it was several of us in the Pueblo Choral Society that decided to start the Pueblo Children's Chorale. It was because of my involvement in the Pueblo Performing Arts Guild that I started Upon a Star singing telegrams. The Pueblo Performing Arts Guild was the organization that fueled um, the whole singing downtown idea. Um, they're the ones who went to the, the merchants and said, you know, would you like to have singers down here? Would you like to have instrumentalists playing? Things like that. So if you, if you have a passion for something, if you want to be involved in the arts in some way, then you need to get involved with those arts organizations. You need to put yourself in there and get involved doing whatever, you know, but being able to keep that ear open and hear what's available is huge. I, you know, the reason I'm so connected to my community is because I pay attention to what's going on in the community. I pay attention to those Facebook groups that, you know, have things going on, whether it be entertainment wise, whether it be just community wise. Um, and I'm paying attention to what people are saying and what people are looking for. Um, I, I belong to the most incredible networking group here in Pueblo called Professionals in Excellence you would need to get involved with a networking group. If you want your business to grow, you need to get involved with people who are gonna be out there talking about your business. I mean, they're keeping their eyes and ears open all the time for me and I, and I as well for them. Um, you know, whenever we see on Facebook, someone looking for a realtor, someone looking for an insurance agent, looking for a singer, um, for looking for something for a birthday party, we're all recommending each other um, right there to hundreds, thousands of people. Um, that is the way, that's one of the biggest ways that I get customers, that I get gigs is through that, honestly. Um, mm -hmm. and, you know, and then Google is my best friend. Make sure you're on Google, make sure people can find you on Google. And if they can't, you're doing something wrong because Google is my best friend. Um, between that and Pi, that's how I get most of my business. People are just searching for singing telegrams Fortunately for me, I am the only singing telegram company in Colorado. So literally up and down the whole entire front range of I-25, I'm it. So if they want a singing telegram, and, and I'm gonna tell you singing telegrams, you know, people kind of think about them, but they don't. Sometimes they're like, oh, I heard of that singing telegram person. Well, that's usually me. So they're usually, you know, they're Googling singing telegrams in Colorado and I come up. So I'm it. So if you, you have to get involved in those things, you have to, again, put yourself out there. You can't be shy. Um, I know a lot of high schoolers, you know, their favorite thing is to be buried in their phone. And that is a great thing to a, an extent, to a point. Yes, it's good to put yourself out there. You're on your phone, you're texting, you're, you're getting involved in social media and whatnot, but you have to be willing to have face-to-face -face communication with people. You have to get out there and get your, get your face known and get yourself known in your community. And then people are willing to recommend you. People are willing to talk about you and they're, they're willing to you know, throw business your way. So that's the way you got to do it. And so that's why I'm so, I have my fingers in a lot of things for a reason. So, um, and it's because one, I like people. I mean, I like, I like people, you know, so you have to like people. <laughs> you have to be willing to get out there and, and, and like people and, and make friends and get to know people, but also because I want people to know what I do in this community. I want them to know about both businesses that I do. So yeah, get yourself out there. Number one.
you've given some really good advice here. And so, and, and so you started by talking about what's your passion. You have to find what your passion is and then understand that if you can make a living doing something you're passionate about, right, you'll never work a day in your life. Isn't that something that they say? Right. Something That's that we right. hear. So find mm -hmm. that passion that it's going to take hard work. Um, additionally, you're talking a lot about networking. Uh, you talked about understanding what your community needs, knowing that you, what your community needs. And you were able to do that very well by joining associations and groups that, that already existed that were in line with what you're passionate about. So you're passionate about performing arts, you're passionate about singing, you join a, a chorale group and you join a performing arts guild. And between the two of those and your face-to-face -face interaction, your networking opportunities, the, the more opportunities came and the more you learned about your community, Christina, to understand what they need and, and what, how you could be a solution provider. So they taught, uh, I've heard, um, you know, luck, uh, luck is really just when success, uh, you know, your preparation and the opportunity align, you know, that's luck, right? People call it luck, but what it means is you were prepared for an opportunity. Um, and uh, because a lot of times you, you could you could say, hey, here, give this a shot. And if you're not prepared for that opportunity that you thought was just luck, it's, it's not going to materialize into something different. So being prepared for the moment is really important. Something else you talked about, Christina, was about the role of your mentor and uh, certainly made you very emotional because somebody that you connected with early on in your professional life that made such a difference for you. And well, in your in your youth, I mean, someone who who really uh, gave you a chance um, to, to say, hey, you think you have a talent and I believe in you and I'm gonna tap you and believe in you. Tell me a little bit about the, the fact when you said, so my mentor gave me an opportunity and I wanted to do good for him. I, I wanted to make sure that I was living up to um, the opportunity he gave me. You know, He believed in me and I didn't wanna let him down. Tell us a little about how students can build mentor relationships and why is it important to have someone in your life like, uh, like your mentor was for you who can help drive you and to, who you want to, um, I don't want to say impress, but who you want to do well for, who you want to succeed for so that they also look good. Tell us about your mentorship uh, opportunities. Well, for myself, now, you know, that I am of the age that I can be a mentor, <laughs> um, I, I really do try to encourage young people, especially in the performing arts, just like Ken did for me. Um, if you have a person that you can connect with like that, you really need to reach out to them and you need to you no, not be afraid to ask them questions, not be afraid to, to let them guide you and to help you. Um, Ken did that for me. You know, he was always there. Um, he's just a, a sweetest man you would ever meet. And, and that's what I try to be for young people too. I just, you know, I'm involved in pageantry as well. So, you know, I do pageants and things like that. I coach girls, I coach, you know, I help them in pageantry too. So whether it's performing arts or pageants or whatever it might be and getting involved in theater, um, cause I'm involved in that too. So, whatever it might be, if you have someone that you can reach out to and allow them to help you, then do it because you, you don't need to do this on your own. I mean, you really, you, you need to tap into those people that can be great resources for you. And that's why I'm always willing to be that for young people. I have young people in my life who started with me when they were, you know, yay high third grade in children's corral, and now they're having babies of their own, um, you know, getting married, um, they're in their 30s or whatever, and they will still, you know, contact me, you know, Christina, I'm going for this interview, or I am, I'm getting ready for this audition, you know, what can you tell me, what, what kind of advice can you give me um, to help me out? And I'm always willing to give it. I'm always willing to write those letters of recommendation that they might need, um, whatever they need. They know they can reach out to me for that. Mentors are so important and you need to have those in your life because there's really no point in going through it, like I said, on your own. I started doing, um, about three years ago, or maybe it's four now, I started going to Walt Disney World to audition for Voices of Liberty to work at Disney World to work in Epcot. Um, the Voices of Liberty are an eight piece, you know, choral, choir group, all acapella. Um, 
I never thought I'd do something like that in my life. I mean, I don't want to leave Pueblo. I don't want to leave what I'm doing, but to go work there temporarily, yes. To go there and do like their Christmas season, yes. I would do that in a heartbeat. So I started going to these auditions and I was terrified. I mean, I have been, I have been a performer for 30 years, but I am terrified when I go to those auditions for Disney because it's just a whole other level. And I mean, you're standing there with young people that are half your age and you're going, what am I doing here? You know, um, I should not be here. These kids, I should just be giving these kids this opportunity. You know, they should be the ones, you know, moving forward. But I mean, Voices of Liberty is made up of people of all ages, backgrounds, everything. So it's not like it's just for young people. But it's funny how many of them will come up to me because they see me standing there um, and will start a conversation with me uh, because they, they see that I'm older of course, but I'm also, I'm also friendly. I mean, I don't walk in there with this like look on my face, like don't come anywhere near me because I am so much better than you and you just better just step off. Um, that's not the kind of attitude that I portray at all when I go into those, uh, those auditions. I'm standing there and I'm making conversation with people and those young people are asking me questions. What do you think is going to happen here? What do you think is going to happen in the callback if you get a callback? And um, they, I mean, they think that I've probably been there, you know, every single year auditioning, but I haven't, you know, I've only been doing this for like three years. But what's exciting is, is I've seen, I've seen cast members of my own with Upon a Star that have taken the knowledge that they gained from me or from working for me. And then they go and audition for Disney, um, for example, or they've auditioned on Broadway and they're working on Broadway or they're, you know, I've, I've had two of my cast members now work for Disney. One of them just got back from working in Hong Kong. She was there for a year as singing Ariel on stage. Um, a local girl here from, here from Pueblo. Um, she was never in children's corral, but she worked for me. She worked for me as a princess. She was my Rapunzel for a few years. Um, and so she went on and she auditioned for Disney and she got the job and she worked in Disney World for a little while, not singing. And then all of a sudden she auditioned and she, well, she auditioned several times even a few times being told she's too old, even though she's got the face and the voice of a 20 year old. Um, I mean, she's not even, she wasn't even 25 when she auditioned for Hong Kong. So, I mean, and then I have another young man who, you know, has just hit his four year mark with Disney World, not working as a performer, but he works in tech. Um, and he, his dream was to work in tech and do sound engineering and stuff for Disney. And he was inspired to get that job, to apply for that job and work towards that job. When I took him the first time, when we had took, a, when I took Upon a Star the first time to perform in Disney World, or Disneyland, he had a conversation with our, with our, um, our workshop gal and said, what do I have to do? What do I have to work towards? What, what kind of classes should I be taking? What kind of training should I be taking in order to work for Disney in tech? And she told him this, 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 and this. And it's because of those opportunities. I mean, it gives me chills when I talk about it because it's because of those opportunities that I gave them, that I provided for them, that they're, they're living their dream now. They're working their dream. And, and they're living their, their best life because of it. And you, you need to have those mentors in your life in order to, to push you forward in whatever kind of, of, job that you're going to go into. I can't stress that enough. It's not just performing arts. It's any kind of job you want to go into. You need to have a mentor to just say, hey, you can do this and this is what you got to do. This, 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 and this. And, you know, they'll push you forward. So I take what I learn at every single Disney audition that I go to and I bring it back and I share it with my, my, my kids, my cast, whatever. And so they, you know, whether it's a job interview they're going to or whatever, they can take little bits and parts of everything and just put it together to make what they need to happen. You bring so, up, I mean, I hope that makes sense. No, you're bringing up a really good point because on the one hand, you're saying be open to mentorship, ensure that you are, that you're willing to, um, you know, be humble enough to let somebody give you direction and provide feedback for you, be willing to take that direction and move forward. But additionally, the other thing you said is that when you get to a point in your career 
or when you get to a point professionally and or in your community where you are able to give back to be a mentor never forget who helped you get to where you are and how you have the potential to also inspire others and mentor them to live their dreams and their fullest potential as well so that i think you you got two good points yes find a mentor listen to your mentor you know find someone who who helps you be your best self at whatever it is that that you're hoping to do in in your goals but additionally remember how important it is to be willing to serve as a mentor absolutely yeah. you you have to pay it forward i mean that's just one of my mantras there period is I want to share what I know. I mean, let's not reinvent the wheel, people. I mean, share what you know. I mean, and 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 pay it forward because, you know, there, there's no point in in starting over and and trying to figure it all out on your own. There are people there that you can reach out to that have the answers and they might be able to give you a little bit of inspiration in in your cause or whatever you're trying to do. So, be willing and be open for that. Absolutely. And I and I can't even tell you how much joy that gives me to share that with others. So um, it's just, it's just a, a fun part of my job. It's a fun part of what I get to do and I'm, uh, sure. I'm happy to do it. Well, I, I am sure again, your, your energy, your passion for what you do and how you live your life is just so evident. And you inspire me to, you know, wake up tomorrow and find a dream of mine that I would, you know, that I'm hoping that I can, carry on. Uh, um, I just, I find you incredibly inspiring. So I'm sure our students will too. Um, what would you offer to students? You know, we, again, just to recap, you know, hard work, finding your passion, finding all the training you can, taking those lessons, being willing to, hey, if there's a course, let me go sign up because I have to be open to knowing what I don't know already so that I can make this company the best it can be. I can make this organization the best it can be. Um, you know, and really paying attention to your community, learning how to network, learning about that interaction so that you're, you're involved and connected to your community. Um, I love that you said Google was your best friend, you know, um, you know, understanding that SEO and how, what are the tools for marketing that will make sure you get noticed? You know, you've talked about mentorship. What do we want to leave students with overall as they think about, you know, hoping to live a life that's inspired as yours? Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a quote from my favorite person that ever lived on this planet, Walt Disney. <laughs> I love Disney just a little bit. Um, and I have this little quote on my computer and I'm staring at it right now. All our dreams can come true if you have the courage to pursue them. And I, that is, a, that is just a quote that I've taken to heart too my whole life besides, you know, figuring out your passion and finding out a way to make money at it. Those are the two things that pretty much live in my mind and circle in my mind all the time. So your dream can come true. You can make your dreams happen. You can work in what you want to do. You can make money at what you want to do. Just figure out a way to make it happen. I mean, don't pigeonhole yourself into a certain career just because so-and-so does it or just because your parents do it, whatever you need to figure out what it is you want to do and then live it to the best of your ability and try to figure out how to make money at it and whatever training whatever education you need to go to to make it happen make it happen but you have to live your dream you have to just you know you have to live it you know i always tell the kids in ja when i do my ja classes i use the example of walt disney because he had his first dream stolen from him oswald the rabbit was his first character. It was not Mickey Mouse. A lot of people think, oh, he had Mickey Mouse and he just ran with it. No, his first dream, his first inspiration, Oswald the rabbit was stolen from him by his partner. And he had to come up with a whole new dream. So when he was on that train ride back to California, he came up with Mickey Mouse. And that is the whole, I mean, when he says it all started with a mouse, it all started with a mouse. So you know, whatever your dream is, it's going to start with something small and then you make it big, you make it happen and you keep working it and working it and working it until you get to where you want to be. And no, I'm no, I'm no superstar on Broadway. I'm no, you know, major recording artist, you know, making album after album after album, you know, in LA, 
but I'm doing what I want to do. I'm doing, I'm living my passion. I'm sharing my dreams with others. I'm living my best life. And that's all I can, that's all I can do. That's all I can say. Um, you just have to do it and, and live your dream. Christina Anderson, that is, I think, the perfect way to close. You just have to do it and live your dream. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, for sharing your story and your passion and your energy with students today so that we can all uh, be inspired from this and wake up tomorrow and, and set our goals for, for what are our dreams and what do we want to work toward. We, we're so grateful for you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for this opportunity. I love JA. Keep it up. Well, we love you too, Christina. Thank you.